All right, preparing for our interview yes, here yeah, with Senator John Marty of Roseville. Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator, for sitting down with us today, your offices. Um, so just to start off, we just want to talk about uh, single-payer health care and specifically your bill, the Minnesota Health Plan. But uh, for people who may not know, could you briefly explain what single-payer means? Sure. I, I think single-payer is a concept that I don't use the term a lot because most people don't know what it is. They know they love it or they hate it, but they're not sure what it is. And a lot of people have different definitions of it and so on. But basically, we mean by single payer that all of the healthcare system is paid for by one entity. In this case, it would be the Minnesota Health Plan, which would be a public um, program set up by the state that everybody in Minnesota would participate in. We'd all pay premiums to that plan instead of through our employer to Blue Cross or whoever else. We'd be paying our premiums to Blue Cross, to the Minnesota Health Plan, and it would be collecting money from the federal government, other state funds that are already being spent on health care. It would be collecting everything else, and those all the funding from for the Minnesota Health Plan would go through the Minnesota Health Plan, and they would pay the providers. They'd pay the hospitals. They'd pay the doctors, nurses, everybody who gets health, who delivers health care, they'd be paying them directly. That avoids the need for insurance. It avoids the need for co-payments and deductibles. It avoids the need for every doctor's office to have so many billing clerks and every hospital to have a bank of billing clerks and a collection agency and everything else. It makes it very simple. Uh, it's the simplest way we do it. It's the way I describe it. It's like a public education. It, it, child goes to school, they don't bill the parents, they don't bill the parents' school insurance, they don't bill anybody else, they they get paid, the school gets paid, and the hospital would get the same thing, it would be a budget, every year a budget, like each school has a budget every year. You don't have to allocate how much came to this student and how much went to their supplies and the time with each teacher for them. You just, you spend your effort teaching in a school, not billing. You spend your effort healing in a hospital, not billing. And it's a huge savings by doing so. And then people can focus on getting the care they need rather than figuring out how to pay for it and how to collect the money for it and everything else. Through public, educa through public education, that was a great example because it shows that this system is in existence already right, across right. different sectors. And, and, and same thing with police and fire, same thing with public libraries. They're already, f you don't pay a bill each time you call the fire department. You don't it's just a service that we all pay for and we all pay for it based on our ability to pay in theory that's what we want to have a system like so people pay their fair share and they get the care they need and isn't your fair share what you use no with health care half of the public literally half the public uses three percent of our health care dollars the top most expensive one percent uses over twenty percent at one percent who are they? Well, elderly folks, certain people with severe disabilities, um, they use a lot more. If you and if you have a twin brother, and you and your twin brother, same amount of spending on health care, and one of you gets cancer, that one may be paying not 50% more, they may be paying 10,000% more, um, thousands of times more than you're spending. And um, that's just the nature of healthcare, and so we want to have a simple way where we're not spending all our time fighting over who pays the bills. We want to have healthcare delivered in a logical way. Example. Um, other terms that are also relevant here are universal healthcare and public option. Sure. They come a lot. Maybe if you could. Sure, I'll, I'll comment on what they are. I mean, first of all, universal healthcare is what what I looking for. Minnesota Health Plan. Um, I'm willing to take any system that's truly universal. The trouble we have in our country, unlike elementary school, where which is element is which is universal. A five-year-old child gets to go to kindergarten. They don't have to qualify. They don't have to jump through hoops. Their parents don't have a right insurance plan. Everybody qualifies. Under our current health care system, health insurance system, well, most people, over half of Minnesotans, get their health care through their employer. But if your employer doesn't offer it or you can't afford it or it doesn't work right or it doesn't cover something, well, then you get your coverage some other way. And so it's a very convoluted system. And if you don't qualify for that and you can't afford this, then you might qualify for a public plan. And if you're a veteran, you might qualify for the VA. And if this, you might qualify for that. And if not, you, you might buy your insurance through the insurance exchange. 
um, shop in the individual market, as they call it, all those ways of doing it. By having a system like that where people qualify and have to find the funds for it, which may not be related to their ability to pay, a lot of people don't get health care. They fall through the cracks. And if we want everyone to be healthy, we want to make sure everybody gets health care, so we want a system like that. So universal is simply meaning everybody's covered. And a lot of things are called universal. Affordable Care Act was sold as if everybody's going to have health care. Yes. No, it was, in theory, almost everybody was going to have health insurance. But if your problem was dental care, oh, that's not covered. We want to have everybody have health care for all their medical needs. That's what I mean by universal, and I see that as essential for a good health care system. A public option, that's what um, President Obama had proposed that originally as part of the Affordable Care Act. We have sort of Minnesota care buy-in proposals, or Governor Wallace's one care proposal. Those are a public option for people who are buying in the individual market. If they don't like the options they get there, or there are no plans in their county or anything, they can buy into, pay premiums to buy into the public program, Minnesota Care. And that's a good thing. I support it. It would give more options, and I think better options, to people who are in the individual market where insurance is very expensive and not very good often. It would be a better plan, but my, while I'm fighting to help pass that, I want to point out that would only, if everybody in the individual market bought into that, that's 3% of the public. I'm concerned about the other 97% too who have struggling to pay health care bills. Because we spend, just to put it in perspective, we spend twice as much per person on health care as the rest of the world spends. There are a few exceptions that like 10 or 15 countries that spend more than half, but they spend far less than us, more than half but not that much more. And so we're way out of line in our costs and our outcomes. Oh, we got the best healthcare system in the world. Well, we do have some of the best doctors and hospitals and research and technology and so on. But overall, our system is so convoluted and dysfunctional and people can't get to it. We do not do well in infant mortality. We're much worse than most other competitor countries. We're worse in life expectancy and other measures of public health. Matter of fact, I think the World Health Organization has rated our healthcare outcomes as 37th best in the world. So we're the not number one. It, it, we're number one in spending far and away, but in terms of outcomes, we're not doing very well. So it shows that the Minnesota Health Plan would not only bring simplicity to the mm -hmm. system, it would bring efficiency right. to the system. And the most important thing to me is better health. There are so many people who, well, they, they can't work as often because they're hurting. Dental problems, I mean, that's a huge one. There are 33,000 emergency room visits going to hospital emergency room for dental problems in Minnesota. It's not a good place to go. First of all, it probably costs about 1,500 to 2,000 bucks per visit. But the only, only emergency room in the state that has a dental chair nearby is Hennepin County Medical Center. Everybody else, they'll give you an antibiotic if you've got an infected tooth. They'll give you pain relief, Novocaine or something, and they'll tell you to go see your dentist in the morning. In other words, they don't treat you. They don't even want to pull your teeth because it's not their field. Um, it's totally dysfunctional, and instead of taking care of dental things, people go there. So it's, it's going to keep people healthier. I mean, that to me is the thing we should try and design a healthcare system to do, not to save money. And the, and the stark examples you listed there of what is currently happening to people right. kind of feeds into our next question. Why did you see the need to right. push for the Minnesota Health Plan? Right. That's, that's the thing. I put together nine or ten, now ten principles I think any health care system should include. Any good health care system, one that I consider acceptable. Cover everyone, cover all their medical needs. Patients and their providers make the decisions. Patients get to choose who their doctors and hospitals, who they work with. And they and their doctors make the decisions together. Not an insurance company telling you what you can do. Not an employer telling you what you can do, like in the Hobby Lobby case, um, where they were telling women we're not going to provide this kind of coverage or that. But you and your doctor make the decisions. Not government, insurance company, or employers make the decision. So I had these 10 principles. I had to have enough providers to meet the basic needs, meaning you won't have neurosurgery in this tiny small towns in northwestern Minnesota, but you'll have a hospital within range of people for basic medical needs and so on. You have to have provider, enough providers. It has to be affordable to everyone, meaning that premiums should be based on ability to pay, not based on how sick you are. 
Um, you should have a, pre, a principle that we focus on preventive health and early intervention to keep people healthier. I put those 10 principles together and then suggested that we ought to, we need a healthcare system that meets those principles. And I actually had a bill 15 years ago or so asking the Commissioner of Health, who was, it was under the Pawlenty administration, so a Republican governor, and I'm a DFLer, and propose um, that the Commissioner of Health would have to design a healthcare system based on these principles. People would say, well, why would you want a Republican to design your healthcare system? I say, I don't care who designs it, as long as it meets these principles, I'm on board. And when I became chair of the health committee, I realized with people dying from a lack of health care access, people remaining sick because they can't get the care they need, and huge problems with bankruptcy and everything else, people just can't afford it. It's more expensive than their rent or their mortgage, everything else. And so I thought, it's time to have a health care system that does this. If nobody else will design a package that meets these basic principles, I will. So we designed that and we've been pushing it the last few years. The principles of the Minnesota Health Plan are nonpartisan. They're more humanistic than anything. Right, right. Like said, I think they're what everybody more. should want. And, and frankly, um, it's interesting when we talk about it, people don't seem to criticize them or say there's anything wrong with them. It's just, how are we going to afford to do this? Because, you know, if, we're gonna, if we can't afford what we're doing now, how are you going to cover more people for more things? And I'm saying, we got to look at this in a different way. We always look at the scarcity mindset where there's not enough health care to go around. We can't, afford, we can't afford what we're doing now. How are we going to cover more people? And my pitch is, instead of focusing on how to save money, if you focus on designing a health care system that works, you might actually save money. And the economic analysis always suggests that it does. And under our current health care system, uh, younger residents, younger Minnesotans are hit particularly hard just because right. of the state of the economy for right. them, people in their teens, 20s, right. 30s. Uh, students who have gone to higher education are just getting a start out in the professional world and everything else, and they've got huge debts. And most of the jobs they get don't have good benefits and everything else. And so we're basically punishing people again. They, they don't have it. I mean, two generations ago, almost everybody had great pensions and so on. and people were taken care of in their old age with social security and pensions. Um, then the next generation, well, I wish people would say, I wish my kids had the same kind of pension and retirement security I had. Now, current generations of workers say, I wish my kids had the same health care benefits I had because it keeps getting worse and worse. And here at the Capitol, just what we're going through right now is proposed cuts. They're proposing to take away dental care and vision care from Medicaid recipients, which are the poorest people. Um, we're taking away dental care from them. We're taking away vision care. We're taking away, we keep cutting back because we can't afford to do it. And the, the mindset is we can't afford things, so it's cut back and cut back. And unfortunately, I'd say one that's cruel, it's really cruel, and it doesn't save money because it would only save money if those people who need dental care and vision care if we take away the benefits, if they stop needing them. Oh, you, don't need, you, you won't get infected teeth anymore because we're not giving you dental care. Yeah, people don't stop getting sick because you're not covering them. They get sicker in many cases and we spend more. And so I, I think it's important to fight for a system that works. And by designing that system, you get a system that should save money. And to buttress that point about the need for everyone with health care. There were some startling statistics that came out within the last couple of years. Uh, this was from the Minnesota Statewide Health Assessment mm -hmm. Fund in 2017 and found that American Indians are four times as likely to die of diabetes than uh, white Minnesotans and Minnesota residents with a disability are three times as likely to live in poverty. Right. A more recent stat from the University of Minnesota's Rural Health Research Center the policy brief released in March 2019 found that counties with a majority of black or Native American residents had higher premature death rates mm -hmm. than counties with a majority white population. So that just breaks we, down. We have uh, our uh, we have huge disparities in our state, and healthcare disparities are one of the worst. And it's it's really obscene. I mean, it, there are lots of things that contribute to somebody's declining health. Homelessness is one is a key one, and so on. But the thing is, so while we have to address homelessness and these other problems too, they have no chance of making it if they can't get 
the mental health, the chemical dependency, the physical health, all kinds of care that they need. And to me, the biggest single thing we could do to improve health and to improve people's access to uh, focus on prevention is to make sure we start out with a system where everybody's covered. And, th and this is perfect for the Minnesota, the Minnesota Health Plan question we have next, because it feeds okay. right into it. And we were wondering, how does the Minnesota Health Plan address residents of color, people with disabilities, sure. LGBTQ residents, women, those in need of more comprehensive mental health care coverage? Right. You were the just first thing that. I'd say about it is it covers everybody yes. for all their medical needs. And that's why some people, well, dental is expensive. Well, it's, it's bizarre. Our country is based, it's historical, but why do we have separate dental insurance than why don't we have finger and toe insurance and arm and leg insurance and other things like that? It's, it's bizarre. Your whole person needs mental and physical and um, every kind of chemical health type of, you need every kind of treatment. You may not need any yourself, but you need to be covered by it in case you need it. And to me, a healthcare system that's universal and that works for people is one that covers whatever their need. And so um, if somebody who is struggling with addiction or, or mental health problems and so on, if they don't get the care they need, that tends to drive other problems too. People who are mentally ill and chemically dependent end up being homeless. And when you're homeless, those problems get worse. Um, so somewhere you have to break the cycle and one of the best things we could do is provide care for people in these areas and it, it has other benefits too. Um, you look at who, who the people are in our prisons, in our jails, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly they have mental health or chemical dependency or both problems. Um, you look at the problems with kids who are out of out of home placements, who put in foster care, removed from their parents' care. How many of those parents have mental health or chemical dependency problems? Huge problems. You save keep families together. You keep people out of out of prisons and jails if you would take care of their mental health and chemical dependency needs. And we do a terrible job. I, I have some family friends who have a son who desperately needed addiction treatment. And the parents finally got through the courts, got, got him ordered to treatment. And then, oh, well, who's going to provide the treatment? How are we going to pay for it? You got that problem. Why should you have a problem with that? It's so hard to get some people into the care they need. If they have to then fight to, well, will this place accept me? Do I have the money? Who's going to pay for it? When you add that problem on top, it just makes the problems multiply. So the best thing we can do to keep people healthier and to address these disparities um, is to help address their health needs. And looking at the uh, economic and financial side of health care, mm -hmm. there was a recent Minnesota Department of Health study that projected that Minnesota would be spending over $94 billion on health care over the next decade. As far as the Minnesota Health Plan, how would the Minnesota Health Plan save both our state sure. and consumers' money? And sure. And, and the, the bottom line with that is if you look at health care spending, everybody who looks, everybody who's interested in health care reform, oh, we've got to bend the cost curve. It's growing far faster than inflation. Matter of fact, in 1960, I think health care was about 5% of our economy. Now it's 18%. It, one's, it was 1 20th of our economy, now it's 1 one sixth of our economy, and it's growing fast towards 1 5th of our economy. So it's just swallowing up everything else. It's hugely problematic. And my point about that is this mindset idea. The, the Stephen Covey, the who wrote a book about highly effective people, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, used this framing that I think works for people. And that's some people view the world with the scarcity mindset. There's not enough to go around. We can't afford it. Um, we got to use less of it. There's a pie, and if I get a bigger piece, you get a smaller piece. You get a bigger one, I get a smaller one, so we're going to fight with each other over it, and we know we can't. We've got to make sure you're not going to use too much of it. And that's the model we've been using for the last 30, 40 years in this country. And a lot of other countries use the abundance model. There's enough to go around. If we don't hoard it, if, we're, if we think about it, if we take care of each other, we all, Paul Wellstone once said, we all do better when we all do better. We take care of each other. If you take care of my needs, I'm able to work. I'm able to contribute to society. I'm more productive. I pay taxes. I do other things. And that benefits you. So we all benefit if we take care of each other's needs. And my argument is that this abundance model is a much better model. It works. And other countries seem to have a health care model based on it. They don't, well, I'm not sure you need care. Can you prove it? 
and they focus on the abundance model. There's enough of it. We're going to make sure people don't waste it. But let's. But if you need help, you're going to go to the doc. If you have a problem with your tooth, you're not going to argue with everybody about whether you can qualify for it or something. You're going to go to the dentist and get it taken care of. And so you're right, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's countries so little known as Canada, Germany, right. England. Most other, <laughs> there's no other industrialized country that doesn't cover virtually everyone. No other country that doesn't. And um, none of their systems are perfect. We're trying to design a system that we think is better than those countries, not worse than those countries. So we would, co like Canada doesn't cover dental, we would. We think all of those things are important. But we're the only country, we stand out like a sore thumb among all the developed countries in terms of not providing health care for everyone. Okay. Um, as far as the politics of the bill here in Minnesota, um, is Governor Waltz in particular in support of the Minnesota Health Governor Bill? Governor Waltz is coming that way. He During the campaign, he actually explicitly said he would sign my Minnesota Health Plan. Um, if it got to his desk, that's not the same thing as advocating for it, but he said it's the direction we need to move. And I think he's, he's looking at, as we're working with him and so on, because I think he can be a strong champion of this. And I, and I unfortunately think we don't have many other choices. When you see what's happening in healthcare, and right now we're putting together this year's Health and Human Services budget, and the House is spending more money on it, and the Senate Republicans are saying, hey, we gotta cut spending, we gotta cut spending. That's why they're taking away dental and vision care and all these other things and making it harder for people to access. And my point is, we gotta look at it a different way, and I think the governor is very open to this, and so I'm very hopeful. Um. How do you plan on getting the Minnesota Health Plan uh, passed in the state legislature? That's a good question. <laughs> Magic. No, um, we, this will be one of the biggest, most difficult social change issues in, in modern political life. Um, matter of fact, my biggest obstacle is people of my own party who, Democrats, who say, well, I support it, but it's never going to happen. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's never going to happen, so we're not going to work on it. We'll work on tinkering with other things. Um, they know what's politically feasible. Matter of fact, President Obama, five years before he got elected president, he had actually told some labor groups in Illinois that the one solution we needed was single payer, but we couldn't get it because we didn't have a Democratic majority in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate and the Democrat in the White House. Well, that was in it was in 2003 and five years later he had those three things but single payer isn't feasible single payer the one thing he said that would work wasn't feasible so instead we'll pick something that's feasible and I'd reframe that question and say instead of one thing worked and it's not feasible so instead let's pick something that doesn't work and we'll push for that instead because I think while the Affordable Care Act did lots of good things it didn't fix the problem and when people say something's not politically feasible, which is often the comment on this, I'll point back in 2008, I introduced the first marriage equality bill in Minnesota. Biggest thing was, well, it's never going to pass. It's not going to pass. It didn't have a chance of passing. And I actually told people I thought it could pass in three to five years. I had people after five years later when it actually did become law say, you know, one guy came up to me and apologized saying he he told his friends that he thought I was nuts because he knew it was never going to happen in his lifetime. Well, you can't predict that. People did not predict in just seven, eight years earlier, they didn't predict we'd have national marriage equality by 2014 or 2015. They didn't predict it. Um, nobody whose political experts were predicting in 2015 that Donald Trump would become president the next year. Um, it's hard to predict the way things work out. And when somebody dismisses something as politically unrealistic, as a guarantee it's going to be unrealistic. And I'm saying, well, to politicians who say, well, you know, we don't, um, it's not realistic, we're not going to work for that. I, my pitch to them is, well, would you do me a favor then and step off the side so we can have somebody step in who wants to make it happen? Because this is too important. We, one of the big stories this year where people are using and when we're trying to get insulin to be affordable for people with diabetes is a 26-year-old young man who lost his parents' coverage at age 26 two years ago, three years ago, two years ago, 
and within a month and a half he was saving up money to buy his insulin. He didn't have his own insurance yet and he wasn't sure he was looking for something that would work and he's basically trying to get insulin quickly he was saving up money he was a couple hundred dollars short of the 1400 they said he needed or whatever and he died painful death 26 year old in minnesota richfield horrific dying because they couldn't afford health care i mean that's that's obscene that doesn't happen in other countries you go to germany or france or any european country or japan or canada and you talk to people about yeah somebody going bankrupt for lack of, for because of health care or can't afford health care or can't go to the doctor or dying because they can't get medical care. It doesn't happen. And we don't know what you're talking about. And we should note that after the 2018 midterms, the top issue that voters qualified was health care reform. Right, right. So like you said, it, the people know it. They're feeling it. Right. And, and the support, the polls that ask in a neutral way, what, what do you think about the idea that we should have a publicly financed health care system, but what, basically what a single payer system like Minnesota Health Plan would be, covers everyone. There's, there's solid support. Even among Republicans, there's strong support. Um, I won't say a majority of Republicans, but a lot more Republicans support single payer than ever supported the Affordable Care Act. And part of the reason for that is it's simple to understand. People don't trust insurance companies are fighting for their best interest. They don't want to have a system where you have to have a GoFundMe page to pay for health care. They don't want to have, you go in greater Minnesota and you look at all these Elks Club or Legion Halls or whatever and they have these big electric sign, electronic signs out in front of them um, on a trailer and they say, Sad, come Saturday night for a fun spaghetti dinner fundraiser for somebody whose child has leukemia or something. They don't see that as health care. You talk about, we want health care where you can go to the doctor when you need. You can go to the dentist when you need. And it's going to cost you less money. It's going to be affordable. You don't have to worry about going bankrupt. You don't have to worry about these insurance problems. Sen Senator Marty, how can people in Minnesota advocate and get involved with helping push for a single payer, both nationally and the Minnesota Health Plan here on the state level? Well, I, I would urge them, there are a number of groups who are going, probably the most easiest one to refer people to is Healthcare for All Minnesota. It's a good organization of activists who are spreading the word. And um, this summer, we're hoping, this summer and fall, we're hoping to have some tours with some public hearings around the state on this bill because we think the need is out there. We think the desire is out there. When I first introduced the bill just over 10 years ago, um, they ignored us. They had no interest in this is not realistic. It's never going to happen. Now, now they're not ignoring us anymore. Now we're part of the debate. Now a lot of the presidential candidates are either supporting it or supporting something that sounds like it to people because they know people are eager to get this. Um, so I, I actually am very hopeful we can move forward on it. And yeah, I urge people to get involved with Healthcare for All of Minnesota. And you wrote a book breaking down the Minnesota right. Health Plan. Um, but did you want to talk about well, sure. that? Sure, he wrote a book, Healing Healthcare. They can download it free online. I, I committed in writing the book. I'm not writing the book to make money. As a matter of fact, I committed to not making a penny on the book. And so it's available free online at mnhealthplan.org. Um, and it, it explains what a logical healthcare system looks like. And I just keep thinking there's so many people who, you mean I wouldn't have to pay co-pays or deductibles? You mean I could go to the dentist? You mean I could take care of this problem? You mean mental health is covered or if I have addiction problems I can get chemical dependency treatment? People love that and their only fear is, oh, well, one of the fears is it's going to cost more and in our argument is it's going to cost less. And the other one, just the biggest one opponents will throw at is, oh, it's government-run health care. I keep thinking, they haven't read the bill then. They haven't read what this works like. We Government doesn't make this, government makes decisions now. It's it's either insurance companies or government who are telling you what kind of care you get now. <laughs> and under this, you make the decision. You even get to choose which, you don't have a network to choose from. The network, well, for the family practice doctor network, it's every family practice doctor of the state. The dentist, it's every dentist in the state. I'm, go I'm glad you mentioned, too, about how you can just read the bill for yourself. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Senate File 1125. And um, it's, it's easy to understand. The Affordable Care Act 
was one that was it's 2,000 pages and they say it's a treasure for accountants and lawyers and and bookkeepers and so on. We want a healthcare system that's understandable for people and their doctors and nurses and so on. And I think our bill is understandable. Um, and you can read the bill and figure out what it means. And you can see that the benefits, oh, people, when they're shopping for health plan every year, well, does it cover this? And are these drugs included in the formulary? And, and can I get this kind of care? And can I go see this doctor? They're shopping around for that and I'm thinking, I don't want people to shop around for which health insurance plan is going to cover more of their needs. I want them to be spending their time taking care of their health and, and actually going in and getting the care they need. Healthcare shouldn't be a commodity. You have to. Right, so. right. And, and it's all based again on this fear that there's not enough. We've got to make sure nobody overuses it. And in doing that, we've made it so convoluted that people don't get the care they need. And, and it's, it's really true. I, I think, and I acknowledge, while it would save money through price negotiations, it would save money through administrative simplicity, save money through early intervention instead of waiting, save money in lots of ways. But I acknowledge it would cost more in one way. I think those other things overweigh that. But people would get more health care. It's not like the sky's the limit. Oh, you want more health care? Oh, no, everybody wants more health care. No, everybody wants more health care if they're not getting what they need now. Nobody wants to, they want to go to the dentist if they need to go to the dentist. They don't like going to the dentist because it's fun. They don't say, hey, I got next Friday off, I'm going to go get me a colonoscopy. That was so much fun. <laughs> People don't do that. They want to get, even when health care is, quote, free, free at the point of service, like flu shots. Most health plans give free flu shots. You know how few people go in and get them? A lot of them don't because eh, it's a hassle and everything else. So you don't have to worry about, you do have to worry a few people who have some sort of mental illnesses that make them want to go see the doctor all the time, but you can take care of those problems. But people aren't out there just saying, I want to consume as much health care as I can. I want a shiny new titanium knee because it sounds like a great idea. No. It's a very painful operation. People want to have their own knees to hold up. So um, I think it's a, it's a wonderful plan. It's logical. It's common sense. When people say, well, this wouldn't make any sense, I say, what wouldn't? If there's something in the plan that doesn't make sense, let us know because we're trying to design a common sense, logical health plan. To, to close out here, Senator Marty, um, with, the, with the younger people in Minnesota, uh, did you have a particular message on again why they should care about the sure. Minnesota plan, sure. what they can do because they'll be up and coming. They're our next voters, our next workforce. Sure. Why, uh, why should they? Several points. First of all, for their own health. Yes. Because whenever they need care, they get care. No questions asked. They get care. Number two, for their friends and others who may not have health coverage right now, they, for their sake, we should get it. So we have a healthier society. We all do better because we're all healthier. And then we're not, we're all going to die. We're all going to get sick at times. But you want a system that keeps people as healthy as can be and heals them as quickly as they can. And the third thing is because we can't afford to do what we're doing now. It's cheaper to take care of each other up front, and that's what we want to do. So I'd say both because it keeps them healthier, it keeps their friends and family healthier, and it saves them money. I think that's enough reason. Thank you, Senator Marty, for your time again today. We really appreciate My it. My pleasure.